Hey, welcome everybody. It's time once again for another episode of WVU Marketing Communications Today. Brought to you by the good folks at West Virginia University's Marketing Communications Online Graduate Programs. Listen as we explore unique Marcom strategies that will help you inform, persuade, and inspire your audiences with the man who's hopefully going to do all of that for us today here. I'm sure he will. Our guest host, Hugo Perez. I'm so glad, honored to be here in this discussion today as I introduce you to our guest this morning, Paula Scher. Paula, I am so pleased and thrilled to get a chance to talk to such an iconic person in the world of marketing communications and in branding and in design. And so I'm thrilled to have you here. For a little bit of a background to our audience, you are a partner in the New York office of Pentagram. You're a renowned graphic designer, person that's been a part of this environment for a long time, shaping a lot of what we're engaging with and enjoying today in our environment. And I'm looking forward to talking to you about a lot of this stuff, but I wanted to jump in and say, uh, let you say uh, hello, but my first thought to you, I'm a creative strategist and I have a chance to work every day with designers and my most fun parts of my job are that symbiotic relationship that you can form. And years ago, I had a set of designers that I was working with that had a challenge knowing how to know when to elevate design or when to simplify design. And I um, structured for them this whole mentality of going between Warhol and Worthy. And I wanted to let them know that sometimes you do creative, wonderful design that should be put up in the MoMA. And sometimes you do design that's awesome and amazing, but it doesn't take quite so much effort. So as a way of introduction and, and um, to you and just even your thinking process, what do you think of that idea? Well, I wouldn't state it quite that way. I mean, I think, uh, and, and it's nice to meet you, Hugo, and nice to be here. I believe that the goal of all design is to elevate the expectation of what that design can be. So that there are areas of design that are very sophisticated, and that's maybe your Warhol analogy, where you're, where you're doing work that's museum worthy. And, and if you're working in the cultural arena, very often you can take a shot in that direction. And then you have work that is more pedestrian. You have, you have projects that may be packaging for certain retail situations, et cetera. But that doesn't mean that you're doing something that is where you're talking down to a level of, of something that you assume is mediocre. The goal is to elevate that expectation too. For example, one of my favorite projects I worked on maybe in the past 10 years was a parking garage, which is a crappy universe. And that because there was no expectation that it had to be good or bad because people don't think about it, all you want to know is where to go, I found I could do something immensely creative. So that where that job was incredibly creative for a parking garage, it may not have been creative for, say, a museum design system. I fully agree with you, by the way. I don't think we should ever make anything pedestrian or throw away, but just the amount of time maybe that you have to invest. I don't think time has anything to do with whether a project can be good or bad. And some of my best work was done really fast. So it goes then, then to talent then. Obviously, if your talent is there, you can get it done. No, it's actually the, whether or not a committee's there. Okay. If you, one, if you have one client and you're in simpatico, you can do something very quickly. If you have a, you're dealing with a group of 15 people who don't get along with each other and try to press each other, it's going to take seven months. What part of the design process do you find the most exciting or fun or engaging for yourself? The moment where I think I may have solved it. Mm. In other words, there's a moment, sometimes it's in an initial meeting. Sometimes it's far down the road because I've been struggling, but there's a moment where I think I may have solved it. And I, I make this decision and private conversation to myself that this is going to be the best thing I've ever done. It never is, but that's the thing that keeps me going. It's that moment where I think I figured it out. And as a designer, are there times that you look back in your career and you say, that was my best work? Or is, are you constantly saying it's better, it's better, it's better, or you're satisfied or find joy in the continual evolution and growth of what you do? I think the latter is, is true. I mean, I, I work exists in its time and there are things that I, I designed that I know were 
very important in their time, but they're not, nothing is forever. You know, that things and times change and you have to pay attention. So let's go back a little bit just to give some folks a little bit of history, maybe some inspiration about their journey. What have been some of the early milestones or highlights in your career that help define you on your path to being such an influential designer in the graphic design world? Well, you know, I, I've been designing a very long time, really nearly 50 years. And I was in the record industry initially. I worked at CBS Records in the 70s, and I produced lots and lots of work for lots and lots of recording artists. Some things were good, some things were terrible. Some things embarrass me when they turn up today. Some things uh, are classic. Like record cover design? Like record cover design, yes. Wow. I did the Boston cover. That was like, that haunts me to the day I die because I hated it and it was a big hit. (laughs) I I had that record. (laughs) Darkness at the Edge of Town, which was an accident because he came in and handed me some photos his butcher took. There were things, things like that. There were things that are charming stories and there were things that were really much more personal work for me, which were really the jazz covers I did, where I had much more control because in the record industry, all the recording artists had a cover approval and the more powerful or famous the band, the the more political the job became. And, and mm. if it was a, a jazz musician usually, or somebody who was dropped from the label, I had pretty much freedom. And that's where I, I could really experiment and do things I wanted to do. So you started in the record industry, and then how did you make the jump over then just to more mainstream or broad graphic design and brands and corporations and identities and things like that? Well, it was a long slog. I was at CBS Records and a stint at Atlantic for a year, which is how I became a record cover art director. I was in the record industry for 10 years, and I wanted to make something that wasn't a square. You know, and also uh, the record covers were becoming CDs and I really had no interest in designing them. So I decided I was going to start my own business and I left the record industry and I freelanced for about a year, mostly doing record covers, went into a partnership with somebody I went to college with named Terry Coppell, who was a magazine designer. And I was going to be a youth industry designer and he was a magazine designer and we got work almost immediately. And, uh, the sort of projects we got were, were youth culture. For example, I did the first campaigns for Swatch Watch when they, they came to the United States, things like that. But this was in the 80s. And throughout that decade, for the first, more than the first half, I think our business grew every year. And then by the late 80s, right before the first George Bush recession, the industry tanked and I was about to turn 40. And I realized that I was probably, as a woman in business, not going to be able to grow very much more. I saw a period of complete stagnation and failure, actually. And Terry left the partnership at the end of uh, the 80s because of the recession, because magazines went away. And he took a staff job, and I was left running the business alone. And at that particular point in time, in the year 1990, uh, Woody Pirtle, uh, a designer who was a partner of Pentagram, came around and asked me if I'd be interested in joining. So I joined this international partnership that was all men and made a calculated risk that it might be very difficult to join the group, but that it would afford me the believability that would enable me to get bigger projects, more age specific to me where I could grow, and it turned out to be the best decision I ever made in my life. And you've been there for, for quite a while now, making successful 30 things. Years, so 30 years in April. Fantastic. Congratulations on, on that run with one organization and having such a diverse opportunity within what you've done there, which leads me to the next thing I want to ask you about. You mentioned just a little bit ago that you had a recent project designing for a garage, but then you've also designed for Tiffany and other global iconic brands. Does your approach change depending on who you're working with? Some things don't change and other things change. I mean, it it is, you know, if you're a doctor, a patient comes to you and they've got one kind of disease, you're going to look to to solve the disease, but you're also going to look to your experience as a doctor. You know, that, that I work in support of my clients and my clients have different needs. Now, My knowledge is fairly broad because I've been fortunate enough to have designed a lot of things and worked in a lot of areas and can anticipate the sorts of questions they're going to have 
And sometimes I'm surprised by them and it, it's completely new, but mostly there's a part of it that's the same. And my job is to take whatever input they're giving me and find the best way of expressing them in terms of their needs and hopefully in a way I haven't done it before. And that, that's, that's the goal of the, uh, of the situation. So the joy comes in the doing. And in the collaboration. You know, like I, some of my clients are really enjoyable and interesting people. And I really like their input and I like working with them. And sometimes they push me to terrific things. What do you do when there's that setback, though? You, I'm sure, have clients that are a little more challenging to work with or maybe don't have a design vocabulary or an understanding of what really impacts. How do, you, how do you push through that and work through that to make something successful happen? I think in corporate hierarchies, it's very difficult. If you have sort of a, a layered approval process and you're, you may be hired by a person in power but find yourself working three steps down, you have a hard time achieving anything. I mean, yeah. the, I can do, I think, on the whole, much more significant work if I'm working with the ultimate decision maker and the, and the person in power. If I'm, if I'm trying to sell up, which is what I call that sort of moving up the corporate ladder to, get, to gain approval or acceptance, invariably the work is compromised. Uh, because you're dealing with fear and indecision and people who don't really have the power to make the decision. I know that as a strategist, I find myself as I walk through the world kind of spot problem solving and coming up with ideas all the time. Is that the same, the same in the mind of a designer? Do you find yourself out there re-envisioning how things should look better? Someone could have done something better on some packaging or on the side of building design or something? Are you that kidding? You I can barely walk down the street without critting it. <laughs> you know, I mean, so I'm like, why is that bus shelter like that? Who on that sign over there? Look at the way that flag is hanging. Look at what's on it. That's stupid. You know, like, I mean, I just, why is I can't go outside. <laughs> yeah, I feel your pain. I feel like I walk in the world like that, trying to constantly fix it, but mm -hmm. it makes it fun. But in the midst of that, as you're walking out through this world and, and enjoying it, where, where do you get your inspiration? Where do you constantly refill the tanks? I live in New York City, and it's a, you know, it's a constant uh, visual. No, enough said. <laughs> it's, a, it's an incredible place to live and work. And, you know, and during COVID, I've been living in my home in Salisbury, Connecticut, my weekend house, which is now my full-time house. And, you know, I, I miss New York. And I feel idea challenged in a way because I, I got my best ideas riding around in taxi cabs, you know, and, you know, sort of mindlessly looking out the window and it would trigger something. And, and that's gone for me now. Or uh, also my partners, I'm not with them every day. I'm not with my staff every day. I'm working through this little box. I hate that. I think it, it's not the way to work. Design is collaborative. You want to see somebody's face and you want to hear not the idea necessarily that they're expressing, but the condition from where that comes from, which you can only do in person. It isn't exactly what's said, it's what's inferred. And yeah. that's what brings about ideas and thinking. I often find myself when I work with my teams, we realize that we're sitting so close together because we're trying to have that collaborative spirit that comes out. So I fully understand the, the challenge it must be for you to be separated and on your own when you're a creative and it's all exuding from you. So I want to leave you with a question here. We're going to take a break here and we can come back in a second. But I'm curious your thoughts on some of these new design trends that are coming around. Things like liquids and fluids and motion in design. And I'd love your take on some of that when we come back from this break. And while you're getting uh, your coffee ready and uh, preparing for the second half of the interview, we want to remind you that WVU's Integrate Conference has moved online. Marketing communications experts from a variety of industries are exploring how and what to say during this unprecedented time. You can view the schedule and tune into the live virtual sessions. It's pretty simple. Just go to integrate.wvu.edu. That's integrate.wvu.edu. And while you got your mouse moving around, why don't you move it over and check out the West Virginia University's new digital marketing communications master's degree program. It's online as well and can be completed in just a year. With built-in certifications from platforms like Google and Facebook, the program gives you both the strategy and skills you need to reach audiences today 
on both existing and emerging media like this. You can learn more at marketingcommunications.wvu.edu. That's marketingcommunications, plural, dot wvu dot edu. All right, back to the second half of our interview. We're back here on our chat today talking with the illustrious globally recognized designer, Paula Sher. Thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. And I'm having such a great time talking with you about design. And before we went to the break, I asked you to think a little bit about this whole design evolution that we're seeing in some spaces with the introduction of liquids and fluids and motion into design. And I don't know if that's something that you've noticed to have much impact or value, or I'm curious on your thoughts on, on those approaches to design today. Well, nothing is really new. What I find very interesting is how much the public recognizes. I, it used to be that they did not recognize typography. They, rec- they thought it was the lettering, you know, or the, you know the words. They did, they, the idea that it had character or form was completely invisible to them. And they've become incredibly sophisticated. I, I'm just, I, my jaw drops by it, by the way, what people will accept, what it'll bear, what they can read, what they can understand. They don't even know they're doing it sometimes. <laughs> yeah. It's really amazing. It was not like that. You know, that, that technology changes, but the thinking and the timing and the approaches are, you know, they generally come out of youth culture in some way. And you'll find it, some of this work is, I think, originally originated in, in Asia, China, and Japan, and sort of wended its way over. And it's, it's made for very uh, luscious illustration. And I think that the trends are good. The the trick is to know when to use them and to make them your own. If something becomes a trend, the best thing a designer can do is really run in the other direction because then you're following, you're not leading. If you can use the trend and you can bring your point of view and the way you would naturally operate in that capacity, then you win. I like that. I like the running away because that's so counterintuitive. When, you know, you start working with bigger brands and established agencies. Often it's like, let's do what everyone else is doing. But, you know, sometimes when you, you zag when they zig, that's when you win and come up with the breakthroughs. I've, I've had experiences where I followed some agency into a pitch and I'm showing my work and they say, oh, well, the other agency showed us that. Well, we're not an agency. And I'll say, what do you mean? And what they did is they picked up my work and used it on a mood board. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's really not, <laughs> that makes me their commodity. You know, that's a very sort of horrible thing to have happen. And that's where trends go, is that you lose ownership over it. And, and the, then it becomes owned by the brand that uses it the loudest because they have the most money. And then that's usually the end of it. But I think then it comes um, to bear down the road because what ends up happening when they go down that path is the level of their talent is revealed fa- fairly quickly when they can't produce it with nuance or detail or, or whatever it needs to be because it's not really their design skill that they're displaying. It's someone else's that they're showcasing. Right. So what advice would you give, speaking of this, to designers and the Marcom professional world and agencies and stuff, how can we better support each other in this world to make sure that the art wins? I think that the level of uh, design has really gotten better uh, over the past, uh, I would say, 20 years, which is the way I would look at it. I, you know, you can't look at anything year by year. You really have to look in terms of 5, 10, 15-year blocks. And that the computer really change design, not just because of the software, which was great, but because ordinary people began goofing around with it and realized what designers do. You know, they could pick their fonts and, you know, after probably 10 years of picking very silly things, they realized that desktop publishing didn't work and that graphic designers were really necessary. Now the facility to draw typography Uh, The customization of personal fonts for corporations has really revolutionized the way design works. There are companies you can recognize without seeing a logo and just purely by recognizing a line of copy, the way the type is drawn. That kind of ownership is phenomenal. That didn't exist years ago. So that visually we've become incredibly sophisticated and that, that has elevated everything. 
Speaking of technology, do you use notepad and pen often to capture your ideas? I'm an idea guy, so I carry this book with me all the time, and I'm constantly writing down ideas. I wonder what your process is. Totally the same. I'm I'm mostly drawing little icons and things like that, you know, like I'm trying to figure out a logo or something like that. I don't do that on the screen, but I'll sit with my team and we'll draw together and then they'll work it up on the screen. And this is what I miss so much about being remote because that's a process that we really shared physically and the physical part of it is as important as, as the work on the screen. Absolutely. So you mentioned that you think that design is getting better and better over the years. That's great. As you look at young talent, what are some tips that you would give them that they should focus on, that they should explore in order to keep becoming better and being better contributors to the space? I think your first job is really important. Where you work, who you're working for, and what you can learn. Um, If you are a young hotshot with a cool portfolio and you go around looking for the most amount of money, you're probably likely to grow the least. Mentoring is important. It's important to learn how the industry is structured, to learn what people's expectations are, and you can learn that from somebody with more experience whose work you admire. If you're working for a place where you don't like the work, you're not going to come in and change it. There's a reason that work looks that way, and uh, you may be paid highly and told you're going to be able to fix it. You can't. So I would say for the first three or four years, the most important thing you can do is try to to learn and build the best portfolio you possibly can. Would you say, are there certain skill sets that they should rehearse or practice? Is there, like, for example, do you, as during your career, have you found times that you're, you mentioned that you sketch throughout the day, but are there techniques or approaches that you should do just to sharpen your skills on an ongoing basis? The most important thing you can do is look at other people's work to look all the time and so much of my work is reliant on typography and you know there's so many there's so much exciting things going on in type design today uh european design is spectacular Uh, there's so many great things coming out of asia the thing to be doing is to be looking everywhere at everything and absorbing it all paul i'm going to ask you the the quintessential difficult question for people that are creatives Name a couple or talk about one or two of your favorite things that you've been able to design and be a part of. Well, the best, I think, most productive experience I've had, which is really uh, still going on, is my now 27-year relationship with the public theater in New York City. Um, I just wrote a book about it. It's very unusual for any designer to be able to work with the place that long and be able to grow with it and change it, learn from it, fail with it, uh, succeed with it, all of those things. And that as a body of work, I mean, there, there were, there's work that, you know, the museums collect or, you know, bringing the noise thing that everybody ripped off, et cetera. But it's the body of the work that I'm so proud of that I feel very blessed to have been able to go on that journey and doing it while I was doing a lot of other projects so that it pentagram enabled me to do that because of the structure of pentagram and the support of my partners. Pentagram is an equally owned company. It's a cooperative and there's no other business like it in the industry. And that the level of the talent and capability of the partners is exceedingly high and it's competitive and it's supportive at the same time. And it enables you to do your best work. That's fantastic. We have a lot of um, talented students and industry pros and novices that listen to this podcast. So I'll have them go and look at your website. So Paula, what are some things that people should know about what's coming up next for you um, in terms of, are you writing? Are you speaking somewhere? Are you doing some projects? Is there, where can we go to connect more with the things that you're doing? Well, you can go to Amazon and you can buy 25 Years at the Public Theater, a love story. It's, uh, I think, currently number one in logos and branding, and it's a book about branding. And so if you're interested in that, the book is very visual, but it's also a personal narrative of what that journey was and very honest. If you're interested, I think that I'm speaking all over the place and you can, you can always find it if you go to Pentagram's site or whatever you're looking at. It seems like I'm doing one of these about once a week. <laughs> too much for me. I liked it better when I flew someplace and got on a stage, but what are you going to do? Absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of new projects that are going to be coming out in the fall, and I would advise everybody to go to Pentagram's website, pentagram.com. 
Excellent. So we're going to leave that right there. Thank you so much for the work that you've done and for the inspiration you are not to all of us as creatives, to um, women leaders that are breaking through, to just the space. Um, it's, it's such a joy to speak with someone that really enjoys what they're doing and is um, looking to better the space um, after they leave. So thank you for the time that you spent with us here today. Thank you. You've been listening to another example of WVU Marketing Communications Today, right here on the Funnel Radio Channel for at-work listeners like you.